everyone. Welcome to the Lexus of Blackburn Women's Herald Sun Tour. This is the second and final stage. I'm Matthew Keenan, joined by Commonwealth Games Road Race Gold medalist Rochelle Gilmore. Rochelle, yesterday we saw Chloe Hosking win the stage, a day for the sprinters. In fairness to Chloe Hosking, I don't think today will be a day that really favours her. No, look, I was thinking when I woke up this morning, when she really wants to, she can get over a tough course. But after driving the course this morning, I'm pretty certain it's not going to be a day for Chloe Hosking. And we learn a fair bit from the men's race with how difficult the final climb is in the gravel section. Let's now take a look at the course. The women start and finish in Churchill, 91.5 kilometres. The wind will be significant, but the Queen of the Mountains points, the gravel climb, that's a game changer. Definitely, that's where the race is going to be made for sure. So it's a very steep, steep climb coming into the finish there. And it's on gravel, so if there's some tired legs from all that wind and crosswinds and fast pace, then it'll be a very tough part of the circuit. And it's a reasonably technical descent. There's enough in that descent that if you've got a 30-second advantage at the top of the climb, you can defend that all the way through to the finish. Yeah, I definitely think that that's the case. I think if you can get over that climb, and you say it's uh, subtly technical, well, I think it's very technical. I think there's going to be some uh, risks taken on that descent, especially if there's a little gap, like you said, over the climb to try and keep that gap away until the finish. So they come down a very fast descent, and then when they turn onto the flat, they've got three or four kilometres to go, but I think they can hold the gap. In terms of the general classification, Chloe Hosking leads. She's five seconds ahead of Raquel Barbieta, nine seconds ahead of Lotto Lepisto. It's then Gracie Elvin in fourth place at 10 seconds, Grace Brown in fifth position at 12 seconds, then Alison Jackson, Emily Roper and Amanda Spratt all at 13 seconds behind. The time bonus has been the difference there. Then on the stage yesterday, there was a small split to ninth place on the stage, and that was Brody Chapman, the defending champion, followed then by Jamie Gunning. They've got 20 seconds to make up. Brody Chapman, she will like the course today. Former mountain biker. Yeah, very much. And she looked very serious before the start. She had that game face on, and she's uh, ready to try and defend this uh, Herald Sun Tour, that's for sure. Like, she, she knows that last year she feels like I was just the lucky person that took that, you know, that took a little bit of a risk and it paid off. But this year she really believes that she can uh, really be in the mix at the end. So it's... It's really interesting because yesterday's criterium had that split in the last kilometre and that those time differences could actually play a part in the GC. They could. By the time this stage concludes, this is the second and final stage of this race, that may well be the difference. Number two just poking into the picture, that's Alison Jackson. They've already gone over the first Queen of the Mountains point in the race for the Crema polka dot jersey. She went over the top in first position. Second place at the top of the climb was Taylor Wiles from Trek Segafredo. And then it was the Kiwi, Niamh Fisher Black, who went over the top in third place. There's still the major climb to come. We've also had the first of the intermediate sprints in the race for the Gatorade green jersey, which Chloe Hosking also leads, and she extended her advantage by winning that sprint again. Yeah, well, interestingly, Chloe Hosking will be really focused on just making sure she brings home that jersey, and she's all got, got it wrapped up by now, but she will contest the second sprint if she's there, but that's what's on her mind. Uh, the other, I mean, the first QOM, I think it would have been hotly contested by all of the, the climbers just to see where everyone else is at. So the riders that we're looking at today, Elisa Longo Borghini, the Italian that's in there, she has won Strada Bianchi and Tour of Flanders. So it's her type of course. But the question is, has she got the form early in the season? The Europeans that come out here, sometimes they're a little bit relaxed with the intensity that they gain in their, uh, what they call their off season or their winter training in Europe. So she'll be up against the really informed riders like Amanda Spratt from the Mitchelton Scott team. They've got Amanda Spratt, Grace Brown also in very good form, Lucy Kennedy hitting some good form as well. So they've got strength in numbers uh, in the Mitchell and Scott team. Elisa Longo Borghini, she conceded a bit of time yesterday. She sits at 34 seconds down in the general classification. She paid the price for doing some work to try and set up for the victory for their sprinter, the Finnish champion, Lotta Lepisto. Didn't quite work out for them, but the team rode well. And Ruth Winder, sure the breakaway yesterday, it didn't work in terms of winning the stage was worth rolling the dice. Well, they did a, a very fine job in the stage yesterday and Ruth Winder put in a, a very big effort and for it to not pay off, I think that will give them extra motivation today. And uh, yeah, while Elisa Longo Borghini did do that work in the final kilometres to try and set it up for their sprinters, which did fail, I think that uh, she'll have a lot of fire in her belly today and really want to make it hard for Mitchelton Scott. But the thing is, Mitchelton Scott have strength in numbers. Elisa Longo Borghini will be paired up with Ruth Winder, who did that very big 
turn or uh, should we say break away by herself a lot of energy put into yesterday's stage could have tired legs so i think uh, it's going to be very difficult to take this race race from mitchelton scott number 54 at the back of the peloton we apologize for the picture break up and the freeze frames that we'll get every now and then that's anya Lowe, the tasmanian who last year represented australia at the junior world championships she can ride the track she can ride the road at an international level in the junior ranks this is a really good opportunity for her to see how big the gap is between the under-19s and the elites. And one of the challenges, Rochelle, for the women is there's no stepping stone. There's no under-23 category. So they are straight into the deep end. I think it's fantastic for the young riders to get experience here. And when I was uh, driving the course this morning with John Trevorrow, the organiser of the event, he actually uh, went out and found this road and tried to find a very difficult course and I said to him yeah it is difficult but I'll have you know it is actually probably the most difficult stage these riders will race the Europeans all season it's very challenging so he succeeded in finding a difficult road he absolutely did so for these young riders to be getting experience here in uh, a pro peloton uh, it will really give them a gauge of where they're at in regards to uh, the season professionals number 56 the Australian national road champion Sarah Gigante she spends a lot of time either at the back or on the front or off the front. She's yo-yoed around a little bit today. She's sitting better in the peloton today than what she was yesterday, yet the conditions today are more treacherous. Yeah, it was um, It was uh, very interesting to see how Sarah Gigante rode yesterday because she possibly had a higher output than any other rider in the entire peloton because she rode off the back and that meant every time there was a split or the rider in front of her dropped a wheel, she did probably more work than any other rider in this peloton. And, uh, you know, she's strong enough to do that. We saw at the national championships how much power she has. Being the Australian national champion, I think it's, uh, I mean, she stood up and sh showed the world, actually, how, how strong she actually is. So uh, she did it the hard way yesterday. She'd have to have tired legs, but uh, she's um, sitting in the peloton a little bit better. We see to the left of the screen there, number 56, that's Sarah Gigante. And a little bit further up the road, there is a small breakaway. We're limited in the amount of motorbikes and cameras that we've got out on the course. But now that the wind is coming from the left-hand side of the road to the right, the Mitchelton Scott team, they're sitting at the front of the peloton. We now get across to the breakaway the easy way. Eventually, we'll be able to see the break and work out exactly who's in it. But that's a nice helmet. Yep, getting a beautiful shot of the helmet there. But uh, we're doing our best with the uh, coverage. And, and we'll... No doubt it passes the Australian safety standards. The breakaway group, though, that's what we're more interested in. Well, we're nearly there. 31 kilometres remaining. The big climb is still to come. The LA Cipollini colours have certainly made it into this move. There's plenty of riders in the blue and white colours of the Trek Segafredo team. And a little wave of the hand. That's Taylor Wiles who's at the front, indicating to this group, let's work. She really does want to get this moving. And we saw that Mitchelton Scott was on the front, stringing out the peloton, which means they're not happy with this composition. They do have one rider up there. We haven't quite got her number yet, but Mitchelton Scott represented by at least one rider. Romy Casper is at the back of the group, and it's Grace Brown who's made it into this move. Grace Brown, she was good yesterday. She is in fifth position overall. She's at just 12 seconds down in the general classification. This is a good move for Brown. Well, it absolutely is for Mitchell and Scott. Grace Brown's in phenomenal form, so I think they may have been controlling their back on the peloton, but it's Taylor Wiles of the Trek Segafredo team who really wants to drive the pace here. This is a dangerous breakaway, but it's a good position for the Mitchelton Scott team to be in. This is a look back down at the finish line, the same finish line that was used in the men's race, whereas Michael Woods, who got the better of Richie Port, and as they came to the finish, it was two at the front, three with the next group, five or six with the next group. That tells us how this race will blow to pieces. The general classification, Hosking leads, five seconds clear of Barbiera, then Lepisto in third position at nine seconds behind. Three sprinters at the top of the general classification. We don't expect that at the end of today's stage. It's in Gracie Elvin, but Grace Brown in fifth, 12 seconds off the pace. Alison Jackson is next best, followed by Emily Roper, Amanda Spratz, the defending champion, Brody Chapman, and then one of the young rising stars of Australian cycling, Jamie Gunning. But Rochelle, Grace Brown has got herself in a very good position. Yeah, a super good position for Mitchell and Scott to be in. We saw back in the main peloton that they were controlling there at the front of the peloton. Ideally, they'd like to have numbers up there. 
and now we'll just get a little bit of a picture of who's driving the pace now because they are really starting to pick this up back in the peloton. The wonders of modern technology. We've just been talking about Sarah Gigante and Dad Mike is watching from Seattle. Well, he'll be a very proud father, that's for sure. Impressive ride at the national championships. Like I said, not only did Australia take notice, but the rest of the world also um, very surprised and uh, excited to hear that there's another huge talent coming through in Australian cycling. And just before we went live to air, the peloton went through the second of the intermediate sprints. And once again, it was Chloe Hosking collecting maximum points. So Big ambitions for green. She will stand on the top of the podium with the green jersey at the end of the Herald Sun Tour for this year. And she has fought hard for it in all of the sprints. So Chloe Hosking, winner of today's two intermediate sprints. And the wind has been an issue all day long. We saw that have an impact on the men's race. And you can see the amount of debris here at the finish line. That will also be a factor out on the road, particularly on the descent, which we've spoken about. And you've clarified that it is a it's very technical. technical descent. Yeah, I think there will be some. And just given that it's so close to the finish and that riders will have those small gaps that they want to either close or um, stay away coming into the finish. And there were a, a lot of workers from the organisation out there sweeping corners this morning, but I'm sure there will be a lot of debris all over the road now after the high winds that we've experienced all day here. So the riders will come into that final climb and the te technical aspect of the climb itself being gravel for the last one kilometre and the descent with some gravel on it as well, some tricky corners. Sweeping the road today is the equivalent to trying to clean the pool on a day like this. Yeah, absolutely impossible. So I think, you know, it's um, we talked about it a bit earlier, Matt, how it's so different to ride. As some of the riders have been out and wrecked this course. They've been over the climb and they've, they've seen the descent uh, a couple of days ago. But it's so different when you're in a race under pressure. And also after you've already raced uh, 80 kilometres and you've got tired legs, it will... Um, feel a lot different for the riders out there today than in their recce. It, it is an incredibly tough course, a little over 90 kilometres in total. At the moment we're seeing a small breakaway group go up the road. We apologise for the little bit of the picture breakup, but bear with us. Hopefully we get the key part of the race. We experience these same difficulties throughout the men's race. Chloe Hosking though, Rochelle, so far winning those two intermediate sprints. If she had big ambitions on the yellow jersey, do you think it would be a strategy to go for the sprints and the time bonus? or save the energy and wait for the big climb? Uh, I think Chloe Hosking is quite unique in that because she likes to open the legs and have a little bit of a hit out before the real intensity of the bike race comes. So it, normally you would say that if somebody was going for the GC, they'd just sit back and not worry so much about the sprint jersey. But I think it's a real honour for Chloe to have the sprint jersey here at the Herald Sun Tour. So she's put a lot of effort into it. She's really earned it. It's not something that was an afterthought. She said, I want to go out there. I want to win the sprint jersey. And if I can do something after that on today's stage, we'll see what the legs have. I'm looking forward to seeing how she copes with the climbs. Stick with us. This is the second and final stage of the Lexus of Blackburn Women's Herald Sun Tour. This is the second and final stage. It's just a two-stage race for the Women's Herald Sun Tour. We 
would dearly love it to be more, and I'm sure it will build. This is the second year in succession that this race has been hosted. It was held a few years ago, around about 10 years ago. There was a couple of editions of the race, and it was sponsored by another car manufacturer. But it's really important, Rochelle, for women's racing that we get more races like this. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's been a tough stage race, even though it's only two days. It has been quite demanding because there's pace on the MotoGP circuit, Phillip Island, yesterday. It was a fast and furious type of race, and then a very hard circuit today. So I think... The riders are satisfied with the, the courses. They're very happy with that, and they'd love an extra day or two, that's for sure. But uh, thanks to Lexus uh, Black, of Blackburn, they were able to have the two-day series again this year and keep the continuity so we can expand on that in the next few years. And build the honour roll, build that history. As you look at the men's side of the event, it started in 1952. Some of the greats of Australian cycling. Barry Waddell won this race five years in a row. He started the race five times. Yeah, I mean, that's just incredible. And uh, we'd love to build that type of history for the women's race, that's for sure. And last year, it was Brodie Chapman who took an extra day of annual leave to be able to ride the race. It was two stages then. The first stage was around Hillsville, really demanding. Not as difficult as today, but still plenty of climbing. She won solo ahead of Annemiek Van Vluten. And then we had the final time trial, which was really short. It was about 1.6 kilometres. And it was fabulous to see second last down the ramp was Van Vluten in the rainbow jersey as the world champion. Yeah, pretty amazing. It's, um, you know, unfortunate she's not here this year. But we saw Brody Chapman before today's stage, and she was very focused. She really wants to have a go today. But there's some, some really strong bike riders out there, and we've seen Grace Brown already put some pressure down. So she's good. Lucy Kennedy, Amanda Spratt looked great yesterday. So we're back with the race now, and it looks like Mitchell and Scott are still controlling very well. And the yellow jersey going forward, and the Finnish national champion going backwards. What? Number 32, that's Lapisto. She was second on the stage yesterday. And she's had Third on the stage yesterday, I should say. She's starting to struggle as the road goes upwards. And we kind of did expect that from the Finnish champion, Lotta Lapisto. She did win a race out here in Australia at the uh, Albert Park Criterium, so she's got a win under her belt and doing the job for the team today. And she would have had a hard job. She's got two climbers in Elisa Longo Borghini and Ruth Winder that could finish this off today. They will be the riders that will want to try to throw it to the very strong Mitchell and Scott team. They're on the lower slopes of the, the key climb at number 114 at the back. This is Fisher Blacker of New Zealand. She picked up some minor points in the first of the Crema Queen of the Mountains prizes. She went over climb number one in third position. At the front on that occasion, it was Alison Jackson. At the moment, we're still hunting down the breakaway group to see if they've managed to stay off the front. Lapisto distanced on the climb, but she has experience in spades. Well, she knows that if she can get back and do one little turn more for the team or chase down one little attack, that it will help her teammates who are the climbers for today. And it'll be interesting to see how Alison Jackson does. She's gone out and won that QOM at the start of this stage and she'll be wanting to finish it off for the team Tipco as well. But there was some really good footage from the Deakin University Kid Evans Great Ocean Road Race with Lapisto. She was caught behind the split in the crosswind was the on-board coverage. There was a GoPro camera on the bike directly in front of her, and she was making the desperate call up, up the road. <laughs> she wanted to sneak through on the inside and try and bridge the gap. 20, 25 kilometres remaining. That group containing Grace Brown has been caught, but there are plenty of Mitchelton Scott riders amongst them. The peloton has been shredded. Yeah, you can see now there's only a few in that main front peloton now, and it is Mitchell and Scott that are controlling this. You'll see some of the Trek Segafredo team up near the front as well. Good to have Ruth Stewart watching with us. She can remember reading about the men's at Sun Tour back in the 1960s. Ruth, we've had plenty of school kids at the start today watching the women get underway, chatting with the likes of Amanda Spratt. Let's hope some of them are inspired to ride this race one day. Mitchelton Scott, they're inspired right now. This is a chance for them to cause lots of problems for plenty of others. Well, they're certainly applying the pressure, and that's what they want to do. They've got some climbing ability in their team. Obviously, Amanda Spratt, you'll be able to pick her out. She's got very uh, easy-to-spot shoes. They're bright blue, so you'll look for the shoes of Amanda Spratt. And she's the smallest rider in the peloton as well, so always very well hidden. But uh, she's been in fine form. So there's Lotta Lapisto third yesterday behind Chloe Hosking and Raquel Barbieri. She seems to be doing it tough here, but like we said, the reason she's pushing on is because if she can just do one more little job, even if it's just passing off a bottle to a teammate, 
she'll want to do that, so she'll fight until she until the, she can get back in there and do one more little job. What has been extraordinary about the Trek Segafredo team is how well coordinated they've been in just their first couple of races. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said earlier, Matt, they won their first race of existence. So they came out to Australia as a new team, never raced together before. They do have the advantage of having one of the most experienced directors in the world, Ina Yoko Tutenberg. I used to race against her even uh, out here in Australia at Geelong. I go head to head with her in quite a few sprints and she's now the director of the Trek Segafredo team and she'll give a lot of confidence to the riders because she's a rider and a personality that knows she's confident in her decision so she'll tell the team this is how we're going to race today be confident back yourselves and the riders will put confidence in that plan. Life in the gutter and life in the gutter is tough this is Holly Harris who's just giving a little bit of distance three the young New Zealanders 111 is Amanda Jamison the experience now from the Trek Segafredo squad at Taylor Wiles trying to improve her position at moving around the inside. Chloe Hosking, the yellow jersey, sitting eight or nine wheels back. She's followed by number one, Brody Chapman, the defending champion. And Hosking is looking pretty good. She absolutely is. And that's like I said, when I woke up this morning, Matt, I thought, you know, Chloe Hosking can really dig deep. If there's a rider similar to Ina Yoko Tutenberg in the women's peloton worldwide, it is Chloe Hosking. She can fight really deep. She's got a big set of lungs on her and she can really dig deep. But Mitchell and Scott, they really are taking control of this. They were the favourites coming into the race. They know what they need to do and they are applying some pressure. And fourth position, it was Amanda Spratt with the most protection. She's the one being buffeted by the least amount of wind. Number 114, this is Fisher Black of New Zealand. All of the members of the New Zealand team, the Mike Gear Holmes women's racing team, are eligible for the Best Young Rider classification. Watch number 76, Holly Harris. She's a pure climber, Holly Harris. She's got Matilda Reynolds, her teammate, just in front of her. Reynolds will need to provide a bit more protection for Holly Harris because she is teetering on the brink of that gap opening up. Well, at the moment, you can see no riders can move up on the left-hand side. The wind is quite strong out there, and uh, Mitchell has got a taking full advantage to try and hurt the legs of these riders before they even get on to the proper part, steep part of the climb. And they, and they own the road there, don't they? They've got them right in the gutter, so no one can get any protection, and you can see it's so hard to move up on the outside. Uh, they're entitled to use the entire road, but why bother when you can get away with around about two feet? on the right hand side tight in the gutter the wind is coming from the left hand side and you see more riders being distanced at the back of this group well they are riding this race perfectly at the moment i mean it's one thing to know on paper what you need to do to put that in practice and get out there they have got everyone on the gutter here and in trouble you can see splits opening up now so they are dwindling the peloton and my guess is that they're not going to let the pressure off and Holly Harris is caught behind that split. Ruth Winder is here. She wears the red jersey, having won the prize yesterday as the most combative. Emily Roper is there in the white colours of the quarter meant the real estate team. Well, Matt, you're excited about that. You've been calling this from before the start of the Herald Sun Tour. She looked so good yesterday. She got into that front split in the last lap of the Criterium yesterday. Very impressive ride by Emily Roper. And now she's got herself in the best possible position behind the strong Mitchelton Scott team. I spoke to her boyfriend before the start of the stage today and he's normally really relaxed and very calm. I've never seen him so nervous. And he said, yeah, I am because she's going really well. And he wants to be in the team car. He wants to be able to give radio instruction to her, but there's no radios in this race. She's doing this through the smarts of her own experience. Well, she's so young, Matt, but she's got so much uh bunch now she really knows where to put herself and she's put herself in the right position here to use all of her physical capabilities today she's uh, really riding well and impressing a lot of people well this right hand turn it takes them to the lower slopes of the climb the climb hasn't officially started yet but as so often is the case and you know this better than anybody else not every climb is classified. You get a few for free. Yeah, there's a few for free in here for sure, Matt. That's what I said uh, driving the course this morning, that uh, the course was actually quite difficult even before the big climb that everybody was talking about at the final of this race. So with 20 kilometres to go, Mitchell and Scott are really riding this well. They're putting everybody under pressure. And more splits here back in the peloton. And number 35 from the Trek Segafredo team, that is Taylor Wiles. 
74. That's Taryn Heather, one of the most experienced riders from the specialised women's racing team. Well, Taylor Wiles is uh, doing well to put in one big last effort to try and make contact with the front riders. She just got caught behind the split there, and she knows now if she doesn't fight hard to get back on to those leaders. Oh, another Trek Segafredo rider. I think that was Loretta Hansen. It looked like number 31 that was slipping backwards. Well, if Loretta Hansen has anything left in the tank, she'll have to help Taylor Wiles get back up to this group. But Mitchelton's got a dropping rider by rider. And now as they've made the turn, the wind is now coming from the other shoulder, so they go to the opposite gutter to give as little protection as possible for their rivals. Well, they are doing this perfectly, Matt. They are leaving not an inch of road for the rest of the riders to get protection. 20 kilometre to go, Mark, that they just head through. The climb officially starts in 4.8 kilometres. But my eyes tell me that the climb has already started. Yeah, it doesn't look easy out there. They've certainly put some riders under pressure. And look, only a small peloton. And you can see Elisa Longo Borghini, who we spoke about earlier, is still in there with Ruth Winder. So they're for the Trek Segafredo team. Last position, Alison Jackson, number two. She's been climbing well. She picked up points at the first Crema Queen of the Mountains prize. And she's dealt with the crosswind okay. Chloe Hosking, the yellow jersey, she's picked up some time bonuses today as well. This is the ride of the day. You can see she's in trouble now. She's just got out of the seat, maybe just stretching the legs, but absolutely the ride of the day from Chloe Hosking. We don't expect her to make it to the top of the climb with the leaders, with the climbers, but she's done well to get to this point. At this point, with the time bonuses she's collected today with the intermediate sprints, plus the ones from yesterday, she's 19 seconds ahead of Amanda Spratt overall. Is it enough? Oh, it's going to be close. Uh, it definitely gives her a lot of motivation, and she'll have this information already from the team director, so that will give her a little bit more inspiration to fight and dig really, really deep. And uh, this is the exciting rider of the day, Chloe Hosking. How long can she hold on and how close can she stay to the front riders? That's her in the yellow jersey, number 21. Just behind her, last year's winner is Brody Chapman. Well, she's sitting on the wheel of Lucy Kennedy, which is a smart wheel to sit on because she's one of the tallest riders in the peloton. Also in there, Jamie Gunning, number 71 from the Specialised Women's Racing Team. 36 is still here, Ruth Winder. 33, Elisa Longo-Borghini, who you've spoken about in glowing terms. Yeah, it's definitely a course suited to her. It's just a matter of what type of form she brings in uh, to Australia at this time of the season. Usually she's not peaking until the likes of Strata Bianchi and the classic season, but she's certainly uh, still in there looking comfortable at the moment. And that's where the big, I think, the big competition for Mitchell and Scott comes from, the Trek Segafredo team with Ruth Winder and Elisa longo Borghini and Emily Roper, as you've pointed out, Matt. I, everybody that's in this group at this point with how hard the race has been can pose some sort of a threat. Still setting the tempo at the front. Grace Brown has done an outstanding job. Third in line, it's still Spratt. Kennedy sits a little bit further back. So Mitchelton Scott with four riders in this group. But at the back for the Tipco Silicon Valley Bank team, number two, Alison Jackson, has just moved herself in front of Brody Chapman, who wears number one. And Jackson looks like she's prepared to sacrifice any of her own chances for Chapman. Well, being an Australian race, that would be a, a nice thing to do. They've both got climbing form, so... And Alison Jackson would be a nice rider to have by your side. So for Brody Chapman, that is a huge advantage. So as you say, Matt, some, all these riders in this peloton are capable of winning this race. Chloe Hosking will do it tougher than anyone else, being a pure sprinter, having a go in a, a climbing stage today. And now Brody Chapman has just gone up alongside Jackson and she's asked for a bidden, taken a drink and handed it back. She doesn't want to carry an extra weight, but look at this ride by number 35. Taylor Wiles is back. She's a strong rider and a fighter, so that's an advantage for the Trek Segafredo team if she can do anything more for her teammates. But that would have been a huge effort for Taylor Wiles. And number 113 just in front of her, Jenna Merrick, the New Zealander. That was smart. She sat the wheel of Wiles. As soon as they made contact, swoops around, gets out of the wind. And there you have number two, Jackson, protecting Chapman. At the front, number 15, that's Lucy Kennedy. She's ready to climb. Yeah, great riding from Alison Jackson to protect the defending champion, Brody Chapman, number one there that you can see. Number 36, the red jersey for the bicycle beer. Most aggressive yesterday, Ruth Winder. There was no doubt who was the most aggressive yesterday. 
She spent the majority of the race out by herself, which on an open circuit like the GP course down there in Phillip Island is a, a, a very big task. We said she's got the endurance and base miles. Number 13, Georgia Williams. She's done a lot of work. Yeah, I think her time's done. She's just sat up and relaxed, so she's been working hard for the Mitchell and Scott team. Job done now. It's Grace Brown at the front, followed by Lucy Kennedy. Third position is Spratt's, and tucked in behind Spratt is number 51, Emily Roper. This is what I've just mentioned before, Matt. Such an experienced mind on such a young rider in Emily Roper. She's in the right place at the right time, and she's just so calm in the, in the peloton. She glides through the peloton. She's always in the right position, so that's going to go a long way for her today with 17.5 kilometers to go we're coming into the tougher parts of the climb emily roper does not have a significant contract for 2019 certainly doesn't have one with one of the world tour teams they must be sitting up and paying attention now oh absolutely and a, a lot of teams are looking for australian talent because the australians when they make the sacrifice to move over to Europe, they're serious. They're not just having a go. They've decided consciously, okay, I am going to move my life over to Europe and have a real good go at this. So a lot of pro teams are always looking for young Australian talent. And Emily Roper, she's got to be one of the most valuable riders on the market at the moment because she's got the physical ability and she's got the experience of a 10-year season pro. She's a smart bike rider as well as a strong bike rider. The left-hand turn... A little bit of respite at this point before the next turn to go on to the official start of the climb. They're still two kilometres away before they see the sign that says start of QOM. Well, this is quite a steep descent as well, so you'll see a few riders on the brakes being a little bit uh, cautious down here. But you can't afford to lose the wheel because you turn straight onto roads that go up again. So I want to keep this quite compact. Get the impression that Taylor Wiles is making the most of this opportunity to somehow do the impossible and recover from the effort to close the gap. Chance for the others, one last chance to have a carbo gel perhaps and a bit to drink. Yeah, a lot of riders will. There we see Taylor Wiles just making her way up to the front. And she'll be going alongside Ruth Winder and Elisa Longo Borghini, her two t other teammates in this group seeing if there's anything that she can give them. Yeah, and one thing we haven't mentioned about Elisa Longo Borghini, she's one of the best descenders in the peloton. So if she goes over the top behind Amanda Spratt or Lucy Kennedy or Grace Brown, she'll be determined on the descent to bring that back. You'll know this. I'm pretty sure. I don't have my notes for reference. Her mother went to the Winter Olympics as a downhill skier. Yes, so she's, she's got the genes, and her brother was a professional cyclist till recently as well on a pro team, and uh, her father was also at the Winter Olympics where he met her mother. So they've got a lot of uh, sporting talent in the family. But the discipline, the mindset of a downhill skier and the rules of hitting the corners correctly, they apply directly to the bike. So I imagine she spent a fair bit of time on the skis when she was a kid. She'll go down the other side of this climb really quickly. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure that Elisa would have uh, really wrecked this course well in the descent and have in her mind that she, if she has a gap over the top, she can even extend it on the descent. If she's behind the rider, she'll be able to close it because she descends really, really well. Number 35, that one last sacrifice from Taylor Wiles. She went up alongside Longo Borghini and also Winder to say, this is what I've got. Food, water, do you need it? Because... I'm done. And that may have been the only reason she put in that big effort to get back. It may have been a message from the team car that the team car couldn't get to the riders that she had to take up. It might have been food, it might have been drink, but just that one last effort she had to put in to try and get back to get a message to the riders. And with no race radio, she had to make that assessment herself. She will have seen that the race has been blown apart. The Team vehicles aren't allowed to come through as yet, so she knew what needed to be done. That's experience. The right-hand turn, the climb has now officially started. And Ruth Winder in the red jersey, she's paying the price for yesterday's effort. Yeah, I think we'll see a little bit more from Ruth Winder. Um, normally we don't see her struggling off the back. She is a good climber. It's Chloe Hosking we'll see in trouble quite soon. She's just taken a drink from the side of the road, wearing the yellow jersey, and looks like one of the Mitchelton Scott riders has just finished her job as well. That's Grace Brown. As number two, Alison Jackson is being distanced. The yellow jersey, Chloe Hosking, and the, the defence is over. As we saw, Ruth Winder as well. So this is interesting. 
That leaves up front for the Trek Segafredo team, I think, just one rider in Elisa Longo Borghini, so she's outnumbered now. But uh, Mitchell and Scott. Spratt it is who goes. Chapman responds. Roper is with them. Kennedy marks the move as well. Jamie Gunning desperately trying to hold on at the back, number 71. Longo Borghini in the blue colours. And the young Kiwi, Jenna Merrick, has been a revelation today. Well, this might be the winning move from Amanda Spratt. We may not see her come back. It's Alison Jackson out to chase her down with Lucy Kennedy on the wheel and Emily Roper, impressive ride. But Amanda Spratt, I'm not sure we're going to see her come back. What has Alison Jackson got? Because Lucy Kennedy's just going to wait, possibly jump across. Well, it's Chapman who's doing the chasing, the defending champion. What she could learn from what we saw today, Team Sky went really early on this climb. And they paid the price later on. However, Amanda Spratt is maybe the third best climber in the world behind Anna Van Bluten and Anna van der Breggen, and neither of them are here. Well, I'll tell you what, um, Brody Chapman's doing a fantastic job here because she is keeping that distance. I thought Amanda Spratt would just ride away here, but uh, Mitchell and Scott definitely in the box seat there with uh, Lucy Kennedy just able to sit on, and it looks like, oh, she's not going to swing off, is she, Brody Chapman? She's nearly there across to Spratty. It can be... Uh, a little bit deceptive with the view of the cameras, but uh, Brody Chapman, it's all up to her. Maybe she was just swinging to see if she was going to get any help, but I think Amanda Spratt's going to stay consistent here, and I'm not sure they're going to be able to bring her back. With Lucy Kennedy in that group of three that's chasing Amanda Spratt, Kennedy, one of the teammates of Spratt, it must be playing on the mind of Chapman and Roper, planting that seed of doubts. And also, let's not forget, number 11, Amanda Spratt, Third year in a row, she's won the Tour Down Under. Silver medalist at the World Championships last year. She's a class act. Yeah, absolutely. She wanted to ride a little bit relaxed and in a bit more of a supportive role for her teammates here. But with that split in the peloton yesterday coming into the finish of the, the circuit race, she ended up being one of the riders that had a little bit of a time buffer. So along with Grace Brown, who did the majority of the work to set this up today, and uh, Lucy Kennedy, the responsibility lays on her shoulders, Amanda Spratt, and she's doing a fine job at the moment. Has Brody Chapman got the energy to bring this back? Still plenty of climbing to come. Another 3.2 kilometres before they reach the top of the climb. The gravel still awaits, and that's where it's the steepest. Well, the surprise was Elisa Longo Borghini. She didn't even react to the attack of Amanda Spratt. That means that she's not feeling the best. Still waiting for her form to come to a peak. As I said, she'll probably be peaking for Strada Bianchi, but I'm sure she would have liked to be in the mix today. Doing a brilliant job here, Amanda Spratt. She's been a great role model for young Australian cyclists. She's only ever ridden in the professional ranks with this team, but she had a real challenge early in her career where she spent more than a year based in Canberra with the support of the Australian Institute of Sport to get over an injury that yeah. could have been career-ending. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, Australian cycling and the AIS really uh, stuck by Amanda Spratt, believing in her potential, and it's resulted in a World Championship medal. medal. So they really did get behind her and work through the injury with her. She had a, a lot of rehabilitation down there in Canberra, a lot of time spent in those dorms, and uh, she just stuck with it. So she's not only an inspiration to younger riders, but she's 31 years old and still not even at her peak yet. And she's always looking for ways to improve. She checks across the shoulder to see what sort of a gap she has opened up. Zigzagging a little bit across the road, which shows us how steep it really is. The TV never does it justice. Yeah, I was uh, thinking we had shots and uh, more camera motorbikes out there. Oh, here comes Lucy Kennedy. That's what we expected, a jump across to Amanda Spratt. Now it'll be the two Mitchell and Scott. So Lucy Kennedy's followed the wheel of Brody Chapman. Where is Emily Roper? Has she been able to respond to this move of Lucy Kennedy? Kennedy has waited patiently in that group with Roper and Chapman, let them spend all their cookies, and now she's launched out across to Spratt's, and Spratt has maybe kind of been waiting, but Kennedy is climbing out of her skin. Yeah, I know uh, Amanda Spratt was determined to give a teammate an opportunity today, so I'm, uh, I'm sure she was looking over the shoulder waiting for Lucy to come. And a smart move from Mitchell and Scott because Amanda Spratt's got a very punchy kick where she can do the damage with an attack. That's what she did. She got that gap and just waiting for uh, the other riders to do the work while Lucy sits on and then comes across. And Kennedy has gone straight to the front. Yeah, I think this whole move was set up for Lucy Kennedy. I think Amanda Spratt wanted to take some pressure off herself today. 
and Lucy Kennedy continues now, and I think no one is going to come back. And Kennedy is on her own. Spratt is being distanced. Well, Kennedy was the stronger of the two on the weekend at the Deakin University Kid Evans Great Ocean Road Race. Spratt didn't challenge in the sprint for second place. Kennedy outclimbed almost everybody on that occasion. She's certainly outclimbing everyone now. Kennedy is free to fly. This is a huge performance. She starts the day in the general classification, 25th position, 20 seconds down on Chloe Hosking. She's made up that time already, and she was seven seconds behind her teammate, Amanda Spratt. But Lucy Kennedy, who only a handful of years ago made the transition from middle distance running to cycling, cycling is the beneficiary from that change. Yeah, and Lucy really did struggle with the um, tactical side of uh, bunch riding and things like that. But this year when she went to Europe and had a phenomenal performance in Strada Bianchi, it really proved, because that's the hardest race to handle a bike and a peloton, and uh, she did really well. So that's where she she overcome, I think, her, her difficulties in uh, sitting in a peloton and the tactical side of cycling, and she is really confident now. And just on this type of course, really able to show her strengths. That element that you speak of, it is something that she's been quite transparent about the struggle to improve in that area. And she finds sitting in the peloton in a crosswind more difficult than descending. Yeah, I'd probably agree with her with that. Um, riding an echelon in crosswinds, especially in Europe with uh, you know over 200 riders in a race, it gets, it gets quite daunting, that's for sure. A cross tailwind can be scary. 55 kilometres per hour nose to the head stem, rubbing elbows, rubbing shoulders, on the edge of the road, fighting for position. Yeah, you, you know, you're playing with two or three centimetres of road surface and uh, sometimes you're on rough surfaces and cobbles and in, uh, in the dirt, even on the loose leaves, it's uh, quite a difficult thing to learn how to do and uh, Lucy Kennedy certainly has been, uh, just with the strength and her, her power output and her numbers must be phenomenal. Former holder of the Amy Gillett Foundation Scholarship. They'll be delighted seeing Lucy Kennedy make the step up to this next level. Well, there's been some fantastic talent come through the Amy Gillett Scholarship. Um, years ago, we had Rach Nayland come through the program and just recently Grace Brown, who went over and had a great ride at La Course. And was here. causing problems here just a couple of kilometres yeah, ago. Riding with one of the best teams in the world and uh, really stepped up quickly. So Grace Brown, another Amy Gillett Scholarship uh, talent that's come through but uh, Lucy Kennedy now she is just grinding these uh, these roads are a lot steeper than they look on the camera uh, the body language is telling the story because Lucy Kennedy is a pure climber and even somebody of her class is laboring pity the poor sprinters that are a lot further back still a couple of kilometers before she reaches the top of the climb the gravel section will be interesting to see how she copes with that more so the 500 metres that come after the top of the climb but it's still on the gravel. descent but uh, she will have a bit of a buffer I'm sure by the time she gets to the top of the climb to just take it easy and be a little bit cautious and that extra time that she's got that will calm her down will have her faster on the gravel than if she was panicking about the group behind and trying to go quickly has a little look over her shoulder there and you can see just backed off the pedals a little bit for this next little kick on the gravel section. She has been out in recon this course, so she knows uh, the feeling. I uh, spoke to her before the Herald Sun Tour started, and she said you really do need to transfer your weight. Here comes Spratz. She's now being caught by the chasers. And is that Brody Chapman that's just in the distance in the uh, black colours of the Tipco squad? Spratt around the left-hand turn. Just emerging from the trees. It is Chapman. Number one, she may not win this race overall. She's 20 seconds behind Lucy Kennedy, but this is a quality defence and it's confirmation that last year was no fluke. She's world class. Absolutely, you're spot on there, Matt. Fantastic ride by Brody Chapman. And she's going to continue to try. She's been out here too. She knows how it feels on the gravel, so she's still going to try and eat away and catch Amanda Spratt. It's not over. It's not over for Brody Chapman. She's closing in on Spratt, and it's not over in terms of Lucy Kennedy. She's made the transition, Brody Chapman, from mountain biking, not cross country, downhill mountain biking. Yeah, I mean, Mitchell and Scott have got the numbers, and Amanda Spratt's really good technically as well. So if Brody Chapman catches Amanda Spratt, 
Amanda Spratt will be able to sit on the wheel of Brody Chapman and she can sprint. Amanda Spratt, she comes from a BMX background early in her cycling career, so she uh, she's a handy little sprinter as well. But you can see Brody Chapman just having Amanda Spratt in sight and knowing, I mean, second would nearly be a victory for her as well. She wanted to win and defend her championship here at the Herald Sun Tour, but uh, she's out after Amanda Spratt. And importantly, in terms of the overall classification, Amanda Spratt starts seven seconds ahead of Brody Chapman. Brody Chapman is on the same time as Lucy Kennedy, and Lucy Kennedy is getting further and further ahead. And I'm not sure that that time check that we saw was correct because just up in front of those motorbikes is the leader on the road, Lucy Kennedy. Spratt's not waiting for Chapman. Here she is, Lucy Kennedy. She hasn't quite finished with the climbing. That one last pinch, the right-hand turn to get to the top of the Queen of the Mountain for the Crema polka dot jersey is brutal. Yeah, it's still 500 metres to go for Lucy Kennedy, who leads this stage two of the Herald Sun Tour. And they've all got each other in sight. Brody Chapman looking behind her. That's not a good sign. When the race is out in front, and Spratt is just a matter of 100 metres or so in front, looking over the shoulder is not the spot to be searching for. It's up in front. The race is ahead of her. Kennedy's also checking across the shoulder for the first time. Well, they're in a pretty strong position, I think, Mitchelton Scott, because Amanda Spratt will have something left in the tank. But I think to give Lucy Kennedy the opportunity, she had to let her get out there by herself, push over the top of this climb, get a little bit of a buffer for the tricky part of the early descent. Just a little bit of freeze for Lucy Kennedy. There's Chapman number one. Just around the corner from her is Amanda Spratt. Neutral service on this race, provided by SRAM. And pretty handy to be on the motorbike on this course. Let's hope that SRAM doesn't need to do anything today. Kennedy still not quite at the top of the climb. These last 500 metres must feel like they take an eternity. Yeah, a very steep last 500 metres as well. But she can see the top now. It veers around to the left a little bit. That's where it drops down. So she'll be digging very deep now. 200 metres. She'll make the right-hand turn. It dips momentarily. And then it's the steepest part of the climb. And it's rough on the inside. She recognises that quickly. And she moves up to the middle of the road and makes sure that she doesn't get caught in the ruts. Well, I thought that was the top just there, Matt, but still a little bit further to go. It's past this 100-metre marker. Where the cameraman is now, it then kicks. That's that little bit of a kicker right at the end that I thought she was already on, so it's taken quite a while to get up this last 500 metres. That's how steep this course is. And she's only 100 metres in front of Spratt and Chapman. Maybe a little bit more, maybe 150. She's about to go over the top at the QOM in the race for the Crema Queen of the Mountains jersey. Kennedy's not interested in that. She's interested in yellow. And that's where we'll get the clear time check on her advantage over her teammate Spratt and number one Brody Chapman. Chapman has now caught Spratt. Well, that's a big effort from Brody Chapman. And straight past, she's not waiting for Spratt. She knows that Spratt won't work with her because it is Kennedy who's out in front. So Brody Chapman is riding like an experienced professional, taking full responsibility for the chase. Well, she knows now that she's going to have Amanda Spratt follow her down this descent. And she's more interested in just putting herself in a position to have a chance at the victory here. So she's going to keep... Keep her sight. She knows Lucy Kennedy is a little bit nervous on the descent. And she's got that mountain biking experience. So it would be interesting to see if she can close in on Lucy Kennedy on the descent. I think she's capable of it. And that's where Mitchelton Scott, we've spoken about their strength in numbers, but with Amanda Spratt there, that's a, a safety net. So Mitchelton Scott really have played this very, very well. There's Kennedy out in front, gingerly around the left hander. Once she gets this T in a section. It's back onto the road. She's off the gravel. She'll like that. Yeah, that'll be a huge relief to get to that section. Now she'll start applying the pressure. It's still quite a, a steep technical descent because it's fast, but uh, out of the gravel now. If Brody Chapman does get the job done of bridging across to Lucy Kennedy, 
Then Amanda Spratt becomes the big favourite to win the race overall because of that little time gap yesterday that you spoke about moments ago. Only seven seconds, but it's a big seven seconds. That's what we said. We really didn't expect that coming into the final kilometre of yesterday's uh, circuit race, but it really is impacting the general classification and the overall victory of this race. So Lucy Kennelly, she knows the task that is in front of her. She's taken a look at this course. She's a little look across the shoulder. Yeah, she's looking behind. She knows that uh, she'll have some riders closing in on her. And let's see what Brodie Chapman can do on this descent. Well, she's not showing any signs of technical flaws at the moment. She's coped with the gravel brilliantly. She's made a lot of progress. She's an engineer by trade. She's worked as an engineer before, making the transition to being a full-time cyclist. And things are working out well for Lucy Kennedy. 10 kilometres remaining for the Queenslander. Yeah, she's very interested to see if they are closing in because she keeps looking over that shoulder. She won't be getting any updates in terms of the time from race radio because there is no race radio. But neutral service and the race commissaires, they'll be trying to provide time gaps and as much information as possible. But at this point, on such a rapid descent, there's no chance for any of those motorbikes or cars to move forward. So it is woman against woman. Yeah, she really needs to just keep her eyes forward here and concentrate on getting every second out of this road because once she gets onto the flat, she's strong enough to hold her all the way to the finish. But it's just this descent, and depending on uh, Brody Chapman's, I mean, risk-taking and how hard she pushes it on this descent. I feel like she needs to catch Lucy Kennedy before the bottom of the descent because Kennedy is a really strong time trialist. She's been a medalist for the last two years at the national championships against the clock. Yeah, you're absolutely right there. If, uh, if Lucy Kennedy gets to the right-hand turn right at the bottom of this descent, she'll definitely have it in the bag. The stage victory anyway, then it'll come down to whether or not it'll be Amanda Spratt or Lucy Kennedy in the overall yellow jersey. Barry Burns is asking the question about time gaps. We don't have any at the moment, but when they went over the top of the Queen of the Mountains point, the gap was in the vicinity of 24 seconds. Which is a huge gap to try and bring back on a descent. She keeps looking across the shoulder. That's the sign of nervous tension. Well, the motorbikes might try to get up beside her now and give her a time check. The second of the motorbikes coming through, that's an indication that the gap could be closing a little bit. She is really worried about the chase from behind, and that is understandable. Brody Chapman found herself in this position last year, descending down into Chum Creek and eventually into the finish line in Hillsville, and she had the World Time Trial Champion chasing her. But Brody Chapman said the good thing was she didn't know it was Anna McMahon Bluton until after she'd crossed the line. She might have panicked if she knew who was chasing. Well, everyone will remember the, the La Course race at the Tour de France this year with uh, Annemiek van Vluten not giving up until the line, catching the current world champion now, uh, Anna van der Bregen, right on the finish line. Sensational. One of the best bike races I think I've ever seen. It was the most exciting individual day of racing throughout last year's Tour de France. It was brilliant. In terms of where the rest of the peloton are located at the moment, they are scattered all over the place. There is no peloton. They're surviving in ones and twos. The woman that I'd like to know where she's at is Emily Roper and whether she's lost too much ground on Brody Chapman and Amanda Spratt and can she fight her way back potentially to get a spot on the podium in the top three overall. Well, I believe she will be working very, very hard to get back to Brody Chapman and Amanda Spratt. With Brody Chapman, she's thinking also, as you said, Matt, it does play on your mind a little bit, having somebody sit hard on your wheel. So Emily Roper, we assume she's out there by herself just behind Amanda Spratt and Brody Chapman, trying to work her way back to those two riders, while Brody Chapman's trying to close in on Lucy Kennedy. And most of these corners, Lucy Kennedy has been able to pedal through been very consistent. She hasn't overshot any corners. She's really got the maximum out of this descent. That's a good descent for Lucy Kennedy if she can not have to touch the brakes because she has got plenty of horsepower. We've seen that on the climb but also on the flat. It's a big engine underneath the Kennedy bonnets. 
well, if the riders behind were closing in, I think those motorbikes would have moved out of the way. So that's a clear indication that she's still got a good gap. I think while she can hear those motorbikes behind her, she can be pretty confident that they're not coming too fast up behind her. Yeah, if they were really close, the motorbikes would be taken out of that gap and our images would be back with the chasers. So the gap is somewhere in the vicinity of 30 seconds, seconds. we suspect, if not more. Little look over the shoulder again. She continues to focus on getting every meter and every pedal stroke and every second she can out of this descent. And if she hits that bottom corner with the with the gap, I think she's going to be very, very difficult to catch. Before this team, the Mitchelton Scott squad, any race they ride on Australian soil is one that is full of pressure. The expectations are that the team will always win. She goes through the five kilometre to go marker. But the good news for Kennedy is that when she does make the right hand turn, it's a tailwind through to the finish line. That increases her chances of being able to survive. But the wind at the finish line here is the calmest that it's been all day. Still windy, mind you. Still windy, yeah. It's died off a little bit, but uh, it has been blowing very hard. So we, we didn't see all of the stage here, but we do... We do know that it was a, a very taxing early part of the uh, the race. There was brakes going all the time and just a race of attrition, riders dropping off 4.5 kilometres to go. So not long now until she'll turn right onto the flat and that's where I think she'll pick up a lot of confidence that she can take this stage victory. We spoke yesterday about the position on the bike of Ruth Winder, who's a much shorter rider of Lucy Kennedy. Lucy Kennedy, for a taller rider, she is also textbook perfect. Yeah, it's not often you see a tall rider look so beautiful on the bike, but Lucy Kennedy has a really nice pedalling style. This is the right-hand turn onto the main road, and she'll see the signs to Churchill, just four kilometres remaining, and she can smell the outskirts of town. Well, she'll be... Very happy to have hit this flat road now. It's just a time trial to the finish. The big question is, her teammate, Amanda Spratt, seven seconds behind her on the general classification. If Amanda Spratt finishes, well, we've got to take in the time bonuses in consideration as well. I think Lucy Kennedy may take the overall victory here. She will. Based on what we're seeing so far, there's a 10-second time bonus for the stage victory. She needs to make up on seven seconds on her teammate, Amanda Spratt. Brett Carter has asked the question, why no radios in this race? Well, at, in the women's uh, UCI racing at World Tour level and Point One racing, which are the two highest classified races, they're allowed race radios. And in Point Two races, which is the category under Point One, they like the riders to get a little bit more experience on um, being more more active and spontaneous than taking directions, just for for getting race knowledge and um, I think it's a good decision that in the, the point two racing that the uh, the riders need to think a little bit more for themselves when they get to the pro level over in Europe and when they're racing point one races they can have that race communication but uh, very safe roads out here in Australia too sometimes the radios are really good for road safety if there's things coming up but as you can see there's a lot of cars out in front there to make sure the road's safe before they approach so no race radios in point two racing, which is what the Herald Sun Tour is for women. Uh, the time gap now indicating, as we are live, Mark, to answer your question, this is live coverage of the second and final stage of the Lexus of Blackburn, a women's Herald Sun Tour, just inside 2.6 kilometres remaining, and Lucy Kennedy now building up an unassailable lead ahead of the two chasers. At least at the moment, we still think it's two. Well, it's a fantastic victory for Lucy Kennedy to have. She's going to take the stage and the overall victory of the Herald Sun Tour. Going into her European season this year, it'll be fantastic to have that win. And she's just had a little look behind her. As we said, no race radio communication, so she's not exactly sure how far they are. But I can tell you now, there will be no catching Lucy Kennedy with two kilometres to go. As for the peloton, there is no peloton. The race has been blown to pieces. They're chasing in small groups. We imagine the biggest groups that will be out there, five or six riders. The left-hand turn now for Lucy Kennedy. Not only is it a tailwind, it's predominantly downhill from this Little point where point the car yeah. is. From there, it's pretty much downhill to the finish. 
So behind Lucy Kennedy, we have Brody Chapman chasing with Amanda Spratt on the wheel. So we could expect Amanda Spratt to possibly take second place. Then Brody Chapman. Emily Roper was sitting in fourth place over the top of the climb with some chases behind her. But uh, it'll be interesting to see if Emily Roper holds on to the fourth place in the stage. And Lucy Kennedy is showing no signs of early celebrations. She is making sure of this, driving it all the way home to the finish line. Stepping up for what will be a significant win in her relatively young career. Sure, she's 30 years of age, but she comes into the sport late after a, an impressive career as a middle distance runner. The season has been going well. She was fourth at the national championships in the individual time trial this year. Second overall at the Tour Down Under. Second at the Cadell Evans Great Ocean Road Race. She's got one kilometre to go before we can change all those second places into a first. Well, happy celebrations, I think, today for the Mitchelton Scott team. Jerry Ryan, the owner of the team, flew in today just to see the women's race. And Martin Vespi, the director, he is the husband of Emmy Johansson, silver medalist at the Olympic Games. And I couldn't count how many classic races and uh, titles she has to her name, but Emmy Johansson was one of the best. Now just recently retired to have a baby, but Martin Vespi in the team car, he's the one that's been calling all the shots for the Mitchell and Scott team here at the Herald Sun Tour. And today he has hit the bullseye. 300 metres remaining for Lucy Kennedy. Wash away all those second place finishes. She's about to collect the biggest victory of her career. Not only the stage win for Lucy Kennedy, she will go out the winner of the 2019 Lexus of Blackburn Herald Sun Tour. Kennedy has been outstanding. That will be hugely satisfying, not only for Lucy Kennedy, but the entire team, because Lucy has been a domestique in Europe, working tirelessly for her teammates, and to be given the opportunity today to show her strengths and to finish the day with a win, not only the stage, but as it looks, the GC overall of the 2019 Herald Sun Tour. And she knows it now, looking behind her, that the other riders haven't crossed the line, that she's got the GC wrapped up fantastic day and now we're about to find out the minor placings the sprint is on it's Spratt who gets there ahead of Chapman so it's a one two on the stage for Mitchelton Scott it's one two in the general classification and last year's winner Brody Chapman hats off third overall yeah an incredible ride by Brody Chapman Amanda Spratt would not have been contributing to that chase so she did a fabulous job there to finish third on the podium and third on GC, I think a fantastic effort from Brody Chapman. Now we're waiting to see if Emily Roper comes in by herself or if she's been caught for uh, fourth place. And look at the smile on the face of Amanda Spratt, genuinely happy for her teammate to take the win. I'm sure she would be even happier to see Lucy win today than having the pressure of being the leader. I think the plan played out perfectly today. That was their plan. They've executed it and they've come away with one and two. Here comes the next rider. It looks like it could be Elisa Longo Borghini of Trek Segafredo with her very strong sprint and Emily Roper. No, no. next through, that looks like it was the Kiwi, Jenna Merrick, who was the next to come through. And we're not sure on the whereabouts of Emily Roper. I think she might have just gone across the finish line. There's Brody Chapman. Brody Chapman, what class. Here comes Emily, Emily Roper Rupert. now at 1.48. So she faded the last little portion of the climb. Well, I wouldn't be sure that she faded, but Elisa Longo Borghini, as we said, yes. one of the well, the best descender in the world, has uh, clawed her way back for fourth place in the stage. And this is Ruth Winder. Big effort from her yesterday in Phillip Island. She's happy with that ride. A little bit of a wave to the crowd. And Brody Chapman, the second to go across and congratulate Lucy Kennedy after Amanda Spratt. Yeah, very good friends, uh, Brody Chapman and Lucy Kennedy, and uh, they will know each other's strengths really well. They both had a fantastic ride. Then next through, again, it is the uh, Mitchelton Scott team. This time, it's Grace Brown. 
great ride by Grace Brown. She was the uh, the workhorse of the team today, doing a lot of work. We haven't seen Gracie Elvin come in yet, but she had a fantastic ride yesterday and picked up some more uh, intermediate sprints today as well. So showing, showing that she's coming into some good form. And the Specialised Women's Racing Team, they've had a good showing today. Jamie Gunning has ridden strongly. So too the experienced Taryn Heather. Holly Harris has also ridden well today for that team. The win now for Lucy Kennedy. One last check across the shoulder. She didn't need to. The advantage was more than one minute. But for Lucy Kennedy, this marks the next step in her career. I think big things to come from Lucy Kennedy. A quiet achiever she is and spends so much time being the worker for the Mitchelton Scott team. Fabulous to see her with the biggest victory of her career. And the yellow jersey of Chloe Hosking. That uh, was a top ride. A big three minutes effort. 40 on that course. And there aren't many riders that have gone across the finish line yet. This is what we spoke about with her being more than just a sprinter. She is indeed much more than a sprinter. There's Jerry Ryan, the owner of the team. Flew in a helicopter today to be here to see this. And uh, a very proud man at this moment. So he should be. They have knocked it out of the ballpark. One, two on the stage. One, two in the general classification. That woman there, number 15, she has been the biggest star of them all, Lucy Kennedy. Well, she's just talking to Amanda Spratt there about the scariest part of the descent. And as we said, she would have been relieved to hit the bottom of that descent and turn onto the flat where she could really use her power and time trialling skills to bring it home. Stage results, Lucy Kennedy winning 39 seconds ahead of Amanda Spratt and then Brody Chapman. Elisa Longo Borghini was the next best at 124. Jenna Merrick outstanding in fifth position. Likewise, Emily Roper. And hats off to Ruth Winder after spending more than 50% of yesterday's stage off the front on her own. Yeah, and the peloton were moving. Um, you know, they're working quite hard to bring that back. Another Trek Segafredo rider coming in now. Celebrations will be getting underway shortly for the Mitchelton Scott team. And this brings to a close, for the women's squad at least, the men have still got a few days to go. This brings to a close a successful summer campaign where they've been the team with all the pressure on their shoulders and today Kennedy delivered in spades. Yeah, Amanda Spratt uh, under pressure to defend her Tour Down Under Championship. Fabulous uh, effort by her and also today setting up Lucy Kennedy for the win. So a successful summer campaign for Mitchelton Scott. And it was a tough start. They certainly didn't have it all their own way, particularly at the National Championships. They missed out in the Criterium, Rebecca Wyzak won. They missed out then in the road race when it was Sarah Gigante. The pressure was on come the road race. And then the time trial, they finally got the win with Grace Brown going out the winner there. But today, the winner of the overall classification, the winner of the stage, Lucy Kennedy goes out the victor. Amanda Spratt in second position, ran out the podium in third, Brody Chapman.